Okay, so it is 7.33 p.m. on Tuesday, October 26th, 2021. Um, good evening, my name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'd like to call this meeting of the board to order. Uh, first, I'd like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, from the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Aye. Patrick Hanlon. Aye. Kevin Mills. Aye. Sean O'Rourke. Here. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Stephen Revelak. Good evening, Mr. Chair. Good evening. And uh, Aaron Ford, who is our other associates, unable to join us this evening. Um, on behalf of the town, uh, Rick Valorelli, our board administrator. Here. Good to have you. Vincent Lee, our support staff. Here. And good to have you. And I don't think Kelly Lynam is joining us this evening from uh, Department of Planning and Community Development. Um, so to confirm that people are here to represent the hearings in front of us, um, appearing for uh, 1416 Edgerton Road. Uh, Sean Lyons with us. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I talked to all the applicants earlier. They're all supposed to be on board. Okay. Well, we will come back to them. Um, appearing for Five Cheviot Road, um, Charlotte Nunez. I'm here. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, appearing for 911 Adams Street, um, Heidi Wedak or Greg Walters. We're both here. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, appearing for 43 Cutter Hill Road, uh, Sai Lee. See the name in the, in the window. We are here. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, and appearing for 125, 127 Webster Street, uh, Bruce McKenna. Uh, his son, Luke, is here. Bruce will be joining us uh, once we come up. Perfect. Thank you. And just checking one more time, uh, 1416 Edgerton Road. Is there someone here representing that project? Yep, right here, Brennan Lyons for uh, 1416. Perfect. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay. This open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with an act extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency signed into law on June 16th, 2021. This act includes an extension until April 1st, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed to continue to participate remotely. Public bodies may continue to meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Other participants are participating by computer audio or telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask that you please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. As chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. As the board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. <clears throat> Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the town of Arlington, Massachusetts discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotomy, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. We are going back to our agenda. <clears throat> um, item two on our agenda is the first of our administrative items. 
starting this evening with several administrative items, including the approval of minutes and the approval of decisions. These items relate to the operation of the board and as such will be conducted without direct input from the general public. The board will not take up any new business on prior hearings, nor will there be introduction of any new information on matters previously brought before the board. After introducing each item, I will invite members of the board to provide any comments, questions, or motions they may have. If members wish to engage in discussion with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself for the record. So the first on our docket, item number two, is the approval of the meeting minutes for July 13th. These minutes were circulated by Mr. Valarelli. Um, I know I had sent in some comments. I believe other folks um, will have sent in comments as well. Um, are there any further comments to be submitted on the July 13th minutes? Oh. Seeing none from the board, may I have a motion to approve the minutes from the July 13, 2021 meeting? So moved. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Uh, vote of the board, uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. O'Rourke? Aye. Thank you. Mr. Ford is not available. Mr. Revelack? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Those minutes are approved. This brings us to the next item, our agenda, number three, which is the approval of the meeting minutes from the July 26, 2021 meeting. Similar to the previous, um, these were distributed by Mr. Valarelli. Comments were received from members of the board. Are there any further comments on the minutes from July 26, 2021? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the minutes from the July 6, 2021 meeting of the Board of Appeals? So moved. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Revelack. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Those minutes are approved. That brings us to item number four on our agenda this evening, approval of the meeting minutes from our October 5th, 2021 meeting. Similar to the prior two minutes, these were distributed by Mr. Valarelli. Um, members had an opportunity to submit comments. Are there any further comments on the minutes from October 5th? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the minutes from the October 5th, 2021 meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals? So moved. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. O'Rourke. Aye. Mr. Revelack. Aye. And the chair votes aye. This brings us to item number five on our agenda, which is the approval of the final decision for 2021A Lafayette Street. So this was a prior hearing at the at that hearing, the board approved, voted to approve the application with conditions. Um, the, this, the final written decision was prepared by Mr. Hanlon and distributed to the board. I believe everyone's had an opportunity to comment and it was redistributed. <clears throat> to the board, um, may I have a motion to approve the final written decision for 2020A Lafayette Street? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Uh, vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. O'Rourke? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That final decision is approved. Um, at this point in the hearing, um, Mr. Work, I know you have a prior commitment this evening. Um, thank you for your votes on the things we needed you for. And if you'd like to log off, you certainly may do so. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. <clears throat> Brings us to item six on our agenda this evening, which is the approval of the decision for 24 Ottawa Road. Um, this was approved with conditions at a prior hearing. Um, again, Mr. Hanlon prepared a, a very thorough and well-documented set of condition of um, decision for this hearing. Um, are there any further comments on that decision? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the final decision for 24 Ottawa Road? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. May I have a second? 
Second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Ramalak. <laughs> Vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Ravalak? Aye. Chair votes aye. That final decision is approved. Brings us to item number seven, our agenda this evening is the approval of the final decision for 43 Fox Meadow Lane. Uh, similar to the previous uh, decision, this was heard at a prior meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals. The board voted to approve with conditions. Uh, Mr. Hanlon prepared our decision. Are there any further comments on that decision? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the final written decision for 43 Fox Meadow Lane? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Uh, vote of the board. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Revelak? Aye. The chair votes aye. The final decision for 43 Fox Meadow Lane is approved. Brings us to item number eight on our agenda this evening. <clears throat> the approval of the final decision for 18 Heard Road. Again, this was heard by the Zoning Board of Appeals. It was approved uh, with conditions. Uh, Mr. Hanlon prepared another excellent set of uh, documents for the decision has been reviewed by the board. Are there any further comments for 18 Heard Road? Being none, may I have a motion to approve the final written decision for 18 Heard Road? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. May I have a second? <clears throat> second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Vote to the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Revelak? Aye. And the chair votes aye. The final written decision for 18 Heard Road is approved. This brings us to item number nine on our docket, which is the first of the public hearings. <clears throat> Turning to the public hearings on tonight's agenda, here's some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. After I announce each agenda item, I will ask the applicant to introduce themselves or themselves and make their presentation to the board. I will then request that members of the board ask what questions they have on the proposal. After the board's questions have been answered, I'll open the meeting to public comment. At the conclusion of the public comment, the board will deliberate and vote on the matter. So the first item is number uh, agenda item number nine, docket 3666-1416 Edgerton Road. This is a continuation uh, from the prior hearing. Um, I believe appearing on behalf of the applicant is um, Brendan Lyons, so if you would like to unmute yourself and tell us what you would like to do. Sure, thank you very much for having me. First off, can you guys hear me okay? We can, thank you. Wonderful, all right, so long story short, what we have here is a, it's a duplex over by the Capitol Theater in East Arlington. Um, and we're applying to do two things. Number one is to put a dormer up on the third floor. It's already a completed uh, livable space up there. Um, the, the reason for the dormer is on that side of the house, if you're facing the house, the right-hand side, there is a bathroom, but um, with the roof lining the way it is, it's uh, tough to take a shower. A, we don't have a window in there, so I'd like to extend it, have a window for uh, moisture, number one, also making it easier to do what you got to do and make it a little bit larger. Um, wouldn't really change too much to the uh, portfolio of the house, in my opinion, but that's up uh, for you up for you guys to decide. And the second thing I wanted to do was add a small one car driveway to the left hand side of the uh, house. Now, currently, there is a driveway on the right side that you can fit uh, probably three cars deep, nothing, uh, nothing side by side. Uh, and one of the reasons I like for this is number one, it's going to eventually be condo. So uh, drive uh, driveway per floor per condo. Now, currently, it is a one way street. So you can only take a left as you pull out of the driveway. And people use both ends of the driveway to park. So unless you have a very small compact car, it's very difficult to use very difficult to make the swing. And in the winter, uh, pretty much forget about it. You're not pulling out of your driveway. Um, so not only would this second driveway be beneficial 
for a selling point of view, but also it wouldn't it would allow not allow a, a person or a resident to park in between them. So it would make it much easier for the resident to pull out and make their swing without hitting everything in sight. Um, so that's a uh, long story short of what we'd like to do and uh, love you guys' feedback. Hey, thank you. So um, up on the screen now we should have, this is the, um, the site plan. So per this plan, the existing driveways on the left-hand side leading down to the garage um, and the proposed driveway as noted with the arrow would be on the right-hand side. Demolition plans, construction plans. And so the would be this single shed dormer um, on what I believe would be the west side of the building. Primary plans and then we'll see this. <clears throat> information on the plan. Um, this is within the footprint of the current house, correct? Up on just up on the third floor? Yes. Are there questions from the board? Mr. Chairman? Yes, please, Mr. Hanlon. Um, I wonder if I could have a little bit more guidance. Currently, on what I think is the northeast uh, side of the house. The left side as you face it is a dormer that already exists with a sort of gambrel roof. And it's not clear to me where the, what's happening to that and whether the new dormer is being built in sort of behind that or whether it's replacing it or what. So my understanding from the drawings, um... Uh, as the applicant to confirm is that the new shed dormer is on the opposite side of the roof from that existing dormer. Over on, on the Cor south side. Correct. And on the opposite side of the proposed dormer, everything is going to stay as is. It's going to be obviously uh, fixed as needed, but um, no, no changes. So a second question I have, Mr. Chairman, is the proposed new driveway is going to fit on just on the, uh, but again, I think it's the north side of, if you think of Edgerton as going basically north to south. Um, and it looks as if there's no real room between that and the driveway next door. Um, I did notice that in the other building on this, uh, that ha on on the street that has a similar arrangement, there's a, chain link fence that runs right between the two driveways. Um, and I was wondering whether there's going to be any similar kind of separation here it, or it doesn't look like it, but maybe there's enough room for some sort of buffer between the two driveways. Uh, but I wonder what kind of separation there will be between the two of them. Great question. Currently there is actually roughly rough number uh, I would say a two foot re concrete retaining wall uh, but on their, at the end of their driveway. So you, it's actually a step down. Mm -hmm. um, so that little wall would uh, provide as a barrier. I see, so you're planning on just keeping that wall. So you'll build yours on that side, on one side and the wall will be, can, will be provide the separation. To my understanding, that is their uh, wall and I have no plans on, uh, uh, you know, trying to work with them to take it down or anything. I plan on leaving it as is. Okay, thank you. Um, looking, Mr. Chairman. Yes, please, Mr. Dupont. So I, this is perhaps uh, for clarification uh, from Mr. Valarelli. So as I look at six point one point ten a, when it refers to parking, where it says in that section that it shall not be permitted in the area between the front lot line and the minimum front setback, which I believe is 20 feet here, 
except on a driveway, uh, and it gives a width, uh, leading to the required parking spaces. But I'm, I'm wondering a couple of things. One is um, that, that parking space um, sort of measurement there, I believe it's eight and a half, it's supposed to be eight and a half by 18 feet. Uh, if I'm reading that correctly. Thank you for the question, Mr. DuPont. Rick Fallarelli, Board Administrator. So in this case, the front yard setback would be 14.1 feet. It's a pre-existing non-conforming setback to the front of the house. Uh, so they are beyond the uh, required front yard setback. Um, they, they are a little bit short in the, um, in the length. Uh, they are okay in the width because a uh, driveway in the side yard, seven and a half feet is permitted. Um, that, that's in that same section, either A or B. Okay. So to answer your question, in this case, the front yard setback is 14.1 feet, not 20. Okay, but the, the actual dimensions of what would be the parking space are not quite up to the requirements. Uh, that's correct, Mr. DuPont. I took the liberty myself to scale that out, and it's fine with Y, seven and a half feet. In fact, we have nine. Um, technically, it would fall a little bit short with the 18. Um, and I think even a compact car, we might still be just a little bit short. But plenty of room on the width, and certainly the front yard setback is fine. Okay, so it's really the length that we're talking about then? Technically, yes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Revelak. Yes, um, based on the plot plan, it looks like there are, the distance between the two driveways is 26 and a half feet. Is that correct? That a question for me, Mr. Revelak? Well, uh, actually, or for the applicant, well, it's it's fifty. I'm well. I'll just do the math. Just do the math out loud. So fifty feet, lot width. You take away. Well, it's a little more that I'm. We'll we'll say nine feet from uh from the right side next to the concrete wall, and fourteen and a half feet to the left side. You know, on the you know on the or on the left side on the other side of the house would leave twenty six and a half feet. Um, a question for Mr. Valorelli. There is a provision. Um, it's 6111, 6.1.11, C8. And it looks like that requires the two driveways on the same interior lot to be measured to be 30 feet apart. And my question for Mr. Valorelli is would you measure that from edge from the edge of one to the nearest edge of the other? I'm looking at that section now, Mr. Revelak. I guess one could construe that as yes. that it would be the distance in between the asphalt of two driveways. Okay. Uh, thank you. No further questions. Other questions from the board? <clears throat> so the, the in a similar section to where Mr. Revelak was referring, there's a requirement that a side yard driveway have a vegetated buffer where it abuts in a neighboring residential property. Um, I'm concerned that at this location with the, the tightness that exists between, you know, between the existing building and the edge of the property um, and where the, there's a wall that's on that side, is there the ability to provide a vegetated buffer between the driveway and that wall. Mr. Valorelli, is there a, a set minimum width for a vegetated buffer? You know, that's a great question, uh, Mr. Chairman. We've talked about this before, but according to section uh, 6.1.10, 6 uh, at the very end of section A, it says side yards used for parking shall have a vegetated buffer when abutting a lot used for residential purposes to minimize visual impacts. Uh, unless that's escaping me and it's written somewhere else in the bylaw, 
it does not uh, it does not specify the width of the buffer it just says a buffer okay and, and second question mr valerelli what is the procedure for acquiring a curb cut in support of a second driveway uh, another good question, Mr. Chairman. So the town has a list of uh, contractors that have posted bond, and one can only use a bonded contractor who's registered with the town when it comes to when it comes to making curb cuts on town property. Is there anybody in town that needs to vote to approve a curb cut? No. Uh, the only thing. With the the curb cut can be up to 24 feet in width if you have the room, um, but no, that is that is a, a permit, a utility permit taken out by the paving contractor through the engineering department. Thank you. Further questions from the board at this time? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mills. Um, we're concentrating on the driveways. Has the question of how much um, of the second half of the half story, how what the square footage is above seven feet, seven feet or greater, has that been measured out and documented? This is what's provided on the schedule that there's existing 400 square feet and that would be increased to 560 square feet. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I, I, yes, I may be able to assist uh, the members uh, if you'd like me to. Please. Uh, so we've been struggling with the half story in the attic. So I took the liberty of doing these numbers myself. Uh, with a conversation with the applicant. So in fact, the 560 square feet is the proposed area in the attic that is gonna meet the definition of a half story measurement from the underside of the rafter at seven feet to the finished floor below. It will be 560 square feet at the end of the day. That calculates out to be 47.86% of the area of the floor below. So he is uh, just under and that would, uh, that would be uh, sufficient for a half store. He's not exceeding that. Thank you, Mr. Valorelli. Thank you. And I did, I did do note on the prior page. Oh, sorry, other direction. Where are you? There we go. That the slope of the proposed roof um, would exceed two and twelve, which is the minimum slope allowed by the by the zoning bylaw. Um, the board is also in receipt of a memorandum from. Um, let's see. This one. From the Department of Planning and Community Development in regards to the property. Um, comment on the slides. Photos of the driveway. So this is the area at the front left of the home where they're considering adding parking. A large street tree in front. Um, and recommendation is we're going to mention the third story of the structure to ensure the addition of our laws, which Mr. Valerelli is taking care of. So plan indicating location to mention the proposed second parking area and curb cut, as well as identification of existing landscape or usable open space. And then they do note that the property does currently have sufficient parking um, without the addition of the second driveway. So are there any further questions from the board at this time? 
Mr. Revelin? Uh, actually, Ms. Mr. Mills first. Mills. Well, I was going to say, uh, follow up on those recommendations. Wasn't there an aesthetic recommendation from the planning board? Yes, yeah, said no. Criteria number six. Minor adjustments to the location of derm windows to align them with existing windows on the side facade. Yep. Back the dormer further from the front facade so it is balanced. Projection on the northeast side. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. Uh, you know, reviewing the documentation as presented to us, the windows did look like they were aligned. I mean, one was a little bit bigger than the others, but they looked to be pretty much rectilinear above each other. Mm -hmm. And the dormer is not, you know, I mean, setting it farther back, I think would cause quite an imbalance in the construction there with the existing walls and what's in there. And that dormer is stepped back. It's not like it's right at the front of the house. So for my money, I really, I'm not strong on forcing or recommending the applicant move the dormer farther back. I don't think it's going to be that bad from the streetscape, if you will. Just my opinion. Yeah, no, I believe it is currently set to be five feet back from the front of the building. Yeah. which I think matches up with their existing floor plan pretty much. That's, I think, yeah, I think that aligns with the, with the existing front building wall. Uh, Mr. Revelak, you had a question? Uh, actually, Mr. Mills covered it, so I no longer do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, with that, I think we will transition to um, public comment period for this item. Uh, so I'll now be opening the meeting for public comment. Public questions and comments will be taken only as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. The chair asks that those wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing to please be patient and allow those wishing to speak for the first time to go ahead of them. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the meeting host. You'll be asked to give your name and address and you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. Once all public questions and comments have been addressed or the time allocated by the chair is ended, the public comment period will be closed and the board and staff will do our best to show documents being discussed. So with that, um, first name on the speaker's list is uh, Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I have a couple of questions and comments. Um, in looking at the pictures that were on the planning board's uh, memo, um, the, the gambrel roof of the existing dormer looks like it was a previous addition to the house. I'm not sure when that was done, but significantly expanded the third floor. My guess is that that was an add-on to the original construction because the gambrel roof doesn't really match the design style of the rest of the house. And this is, a, this is an R2 zoning area, correct, Mr. Chairman? That is correct. Um, the addition of the shed roof on the other side of that main house front to back dormer is going to expand that third floor pretty significantly. Uh, I, I know as long as it's still used by the story below, it, it is, it's a two family. However, how hard would it be to convert this now over to three family home in a two family zone with that much space on the top story, the third floor? You know, I, I know I'm talking about a hypothetical here, but th this is now that that third story is significantly expanded now. If you had a shed dormer and a now a second driveway that would have enough parking spaces for a three family home at this point, I, I don't see that as that far out of the realm of possibility. 
I know it would require approval to do a three family, but not there's significant space on that third floor now. And I'm that combined with a second driveway uh, strikes me as this, this house is now filled up a lot. Uh, and I don't know, I'm also thinking about the, um, the recent ADU uh, warrant article with the town meeting. I don't, how hard would it be to convert that third story over ADU now once that, once that new shed dorm was built? So if they were to convert to three family, it would, they would need to have a, well, they would, they would have to do it as an ADU. And so they would be size limited to the size of the right. ADU unit. Um, they would need to have a full second means of egress for that unit. Um, and also because it would become a three family, um, technically it no longer falls under the residential building code. It falls under the commercial building code. Um, and so there are code requirements um, that would additional code requirements that would come into effect. I do not know off the top of my hand what, what those are, um, but there would be additional requirements that would come as a result of that. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Revelak. Uh, I will just note that in an R2 zone, three family is not an allowed use. Yeah. Right, which is why I bring up the ADU uh, position. I just, I'm, I'm wondering now though with, basically my, my point is with, the new, um, the new Warren article and the ADU regulations that have been approved, how many of these sorts of expansions are precursors to ADU development? And with the additional driveway, then there's enough parking as well. Um, and then there's the, the concern I have, the side concern, which is now you've taken the outside uh, yard and converted it pretty much entirely to driveway. And I don't think that's a particularly good uh, aesthetic and it also permeable surface issue wise means you're decreasing the surface. I believe the planning board talked to those recommendations, uh, talked about those issues. Um, and and what, what, one last question, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. This is a non conforming uh, lot and a non conforming house on the lot, correct? I believe both of those are correct. The board is now the decision before is whether or not to extend nonconformity further. Is that correct? Um, that is, well, I, I think by, <laughs> I, well, I, I'm guessing by increasing the amount of space on the third floor, it, it breaks conformity. And I just, I, I guess I'm understanding, not having trouble understanding the board's position on extending what is already a non-conforming situation is a further non-conformity. I've been flummoxed by that a couple of times now in trying to understand how this works when you do approvals of a house that's already outside the regulation to further be that way. I, I don't quite understand why, I guess why that's okay. Mm -hmm. Well, the, so there's, a, there's two things. One is in the zoning bylaw, any um, alteration, <coughs> Bless you. Um, that occurs within the foundation line of the house is not considered, uh, is still considered to be a nonconformity, but it is not considered to be more detrimental, which is the, uh, the criteria that the board has to approve. So okay. as long as the third floor addition is stays within the footprint of the house, um, it's not considered detrimental. However, what typically happens is um, the, comp the computation for usable open space um, is usually the, the next criteria that comes up. And that is a percentage of a lot area that's a minimum 25 feet on two sides. And it's a ratio of that to the gross floor area of the house. And what is typical in areas like East Arlington is these, uh, the, the lots are so small that they're currently, they were built at the time before that bylaw came into effect and they were effectively have zero usable open space when they're at this time. And so the board has longstanding precedent that um, if, the, if the building already has zero usable open space and the addition creates, the creation of the addition does not change that fact. And so the fact that we're going from zero usable open space to zero usable open space, um, the board has taken a position that it does not consider that to be um, a more detrimental to the neighborhood as long as 
the addition to the third floor is not exceeding the half floor requirement and the built structure remains a two and a half story structure. Okay, and the, Mr. Chairman, the addition of the driveway is not going to increase the usable open space outside the house? Nope. The, so the usable open space only counts an area that is 25 feet by 25 feet or more. And so the, the front yard in this building does not count as usable open space. And if I re reference back to- Okay, all right. Well, thank, I appreciate the, the education for me, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, it just, I think we're gonna be left here where the house is surrounded by driveway and a huge, uh, huge third story. But en enough of my comments. Thank you for uh, being patient with me. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, next to speaker list, uh, uh, Kevin Leahy. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Kevin Leahy. I'm at 10 Egerton Road. Um, so I would also like to echo Mr. Moore's concerns about a house being essentially surrounded by driveway, especially uh, with respect to the residential design guidelines and uh, their comments on aesthetics uh, and also permeability. Uh, but our, our main issue uh, is that of the vegetated buffer. Uh, it would hinder our ability to move, remove snow from our driveway. Uh, and cause us problems in the winter uh, as neighbors. Um, I'd also like to dispute the applicant's notion that uh, the driveways are unusable in the winter and that you can't uh, pull out. I think there are plenty of examples in this neighborhood of uh, single width driveways that get perfect use. So uh, safety and accessibility uh, is not an issue. But again, the primary issues here uh, in my mind are um, the accessibility and the, the vegetated buffer. I, I would prefer not to have a house entirely surrounded by a driveway. Very good, thank you. Um, anything further? That's all for me, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, please. I, I wonder if I could ask, mm -hmm. is the problem with, the, is your concern that there's going to be a vegetated buffer and that it will interfere with removal of snow or are you concerned uh, that there won't be one? I'm concerned about the, the lack of a vegetated buffer. We, okay. we would essentially be left with no choice but to shovel snow into from the driveway into the driveway or uh, you know haul it all the way out to the street or something. But you're not currently shoveling it onto your neighbor's property though, are you? No, we can get it onto the wall right now. I see. Thank you. I mean, it, it, if I may, it's only going, I believe it was 14 feet deep. So there'll still be plenty of uh, space to put snow there past the driveway. And also if you're shoveling snow on the, let's see about 12, 12 inch wide concrete uh, barrier. I mean, and it's none's going in the, our, uh, green area, it shouldn't make a difference, correct? If you're not shoveling anything into our yard, what would make the difference if you're just going on top of the wall? Fair point. Um, uh, Ed, uh, next is uh, identified as Boulay at 12 Edgerton Road. Uh, yes, uh, Michael Boulay at 12 Edgerton Road. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I also echo the previous comments of uh, Mr. Moore and Mr. Leahy. Um, I think to um, continue with the discussion of, of snow, I think creating another curb cut would uh, reduce the uh, ability to put snow uh, on the, um, uh, on the uh, curb in front of the houses which will result in piled snow that's even taller than it is uh, now with the current configuration, which I think does create a, a pedestrian safety issue in the, in the winter time in the snow. I think additionally, I'd, I'd like to um, point out that the house has provided, has, has served as a dual family house for uh, many years, at, at least the uh, 12 years that I've lived here and I suspect many years before that. Um, it's not clear to me that the, there's a, a clear need for the public or the public's convenience to add a second driveway. Uh, additionally, I'd like to point out that the address, um, this neighborhood is in close proximity to Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, so our end of the street is often used by parking by Mass Avenue businesses and, uh, 
and people who visit those businesses. So the street is, is often quite congested and removing a parking spot or on, uh, by creating a curb cut, I think will further challenge uh, the, uh, the, the parking situation here on, on, in our part of East Arlington. I, I think additionally, um, I would like to raise a, a question, perhaps whether uh, the addition of the driveway um, has, uh, whether an additional driveway will impact the health of the very large and mature tree, uh, the street tree there, and uh, and verify that it's it's not going to be harmed by um, whatever driveway surface is is going to take away from the tree roots. I'm, I think we do have a, a tree warden who maybe weighing on, on that issue. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then just echoing the the, the uh, planning board's uh, memo about the aesthetics, um, I, I think uh, it, it would. Um, it, I, I we I agree with the uh, the planning board's um, concerns about the aesthetics of the neighborhood and in paving a, a second driveway. Thank you very much. Can I, if I may, can I respond or is it not my time? Um, I can't see who's speaking. Uh, Brendan, Brendan Lyons. Okay. Um, if I can ask you to hold. Sure thing. Thank you. Um, next up uh, is Will McMillan at 11 Edgerton Road. Thanks. Um, First of all, thank you to everyone who's part of this process. I'm just fascinated and amazed to learn all the details of how the town of Arlington works. Um, I live across the street. I managed to spend most of my life avoiding using fossil fuels. I love the tree across the street, which I think is a sycamore. We had a microburst in our neighborhood here. You may remember it a few years ago and a huge number of mature trees in East Arlington and North Cambridge all came down. And so I'm kind of the Lorax here at this meeting and I echo the concern about the health of that tree. I think it's kind of ironic, well, not ironic. I think it's beautiful timing that we're meeting on the night of a nor'easter when we may have incredible rainfall and we were blessed, I'm sure, after the result of a zillion meetings with having two great swales built at the bottom of our street to help with how water flows in our neighborhood. And it just seems like as much as I appreciate how difficult it is for parking and as much as I appreciate how Mr. Lyons is thinking ahead and trying to make life easier for his future tenants or his future condo owners, um, I share the concerns about the health of that tree. I got to assume ignorantly maybe that it's getting a lot of its water from the front yard at this property. And our culture is just doing a really horrible job with how we're paving everything over just one square foot at a time. So if, if there is some way to, if this driveway gets approved to do it so that it's a little bit more forward thinking and not just a great friendly contractor rolling in and putting a whole lot of asphalt down and adding more water that's going to pour down the street into those swales. That would be awesome. So this is the Lorax just checking out saying thank you all for all of your consideration of these important things. Thank you, sir. Uh, next up is Cook at 13. Hi, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Joe Cook at 13 Egerton. We've also been here about 30 years. And I guess I would echo what the previous people have said, but I'd also just want to say the town is really trying to get away from making it more appealing to cars with the bike lane and the bus lane. And I think this is a step away from that. And I think if we're going to start allowing homes to have, I don't know if it's going to be one or two parking spaces. I couldn't quite tell from the plan. Um, but I don't think we want to be making it more attractive for people to have cars in East Arlington. I think we should be working to make it less attractive. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, and I see Mr. Mr. Moore has his hand up. I was actually going to ask him in regards to the tree. Mr. Moore is a member of the town's tree committee. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's a, that's exactly what I was going to comment on. I, I know this is my second time, however, I speak as a member of the tree committee now. Um, yes, the concerns about the tree are valid. Um, the critical root zone is the amount of uh, the roots basically following kind of the drip line of the tree. And uh, basically the, for every inch diameter of the tree thickness at breast height, uh, you have to go out in a, a circle that is uh, two feet in diameter, every inch. So for this one that looks roughly to be my mind, maybe a 14 inch trunk, maybe it may be wider. Um, it would have to be a, a 14, uh, 28 foot diameter circle with a tree in its center. Uh, and the driveway probably is going to impinge right there. That, that's true. So um, that, that would be an issue. This, this particular street tree is protected by chapter 87 of the Massachusetts laws um, that uh, construction can't, uh, can't be taken. Uh, without uh, approval. And my guess is from what I'm hearing from the neighbors that a tree hearing uh, would be held where the neighbors would object to the, you know, the tree if that was the applicant's intent. I'm not saying it is. Uh, I'm just saying that uh, the tree is protected uh, and that would have to be considered um, in, in, in the case of a driveway impinging on the critical root zone because you can't protect what you're cutting for a cutting of a driveway. Um, so that would be a problem. The tree warden would have to be engaged. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm answering folks' question here, but um, that's the comment I have, unless someone has a specific tree-related question, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Further. I think that's perfect. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I have a question for Mr. Moore that may or may not be tree-related, but it's on the subject that he's having given opinions before. Um, is there any... I mean, there's the image of this house surrounded by asphalt is a compelling one. Um, and I'm wondering if there are alternatives that use some sort of an impervious pavement uh, that that might address some difficulties of the, that kind in, in the in the proposed driveway. I'm not I'm not sure what there would be. And obviously it wouldn't necessarily affect the aesthetics unless it was painted to look like grass but uh but it would affect the 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 uh permeable increasing the permeable surface what alternatives do you think there are there um mr chairman please um yeah you mr handling you're you're quite correct i i may have commented before on on other projects there is permeable paving now that allows water to go through it and down to the and yes that is that is recommended to not increase the impermeable space by putting down uh, straight uh, asphalt or bituminous concrete but rather the permeable allows the water to move through it they're doing this roadways now as well the the issue here tree wise though would be that they would probably have to cut the driveway in the critical root zone because that root zone is large for this tree as previous uh, folks have spoken um, and I'm not sure how you could do that exactly. Depending on the type of tree, it may not be a surface root tree, so the issue may not be as major. However, to your question, yes, there are, there are definitely methods. The town has started to adopt these methods in their planting pits. If you ever walk along the Broadway Plaza part away from the plaza towards Medford, you can see that sort of, uh, that sort of material being used to allow water to get to the roots. So yes, it is certainly a possibility. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Are there any further questions uh, or comments from the public? Seeing none, I will go ahead and close the public comment period for this hearing. Um, we'll return to the applicant. Um, you had a, had wanted to address the questions about the driveway. Yeah, just a few quick points. Um, I guess we'll start with the tree. I completely agree, gorgeous tree, but however, it does raise some safety concerns there. Um, and now I'm, I, I'm mid twenties at this point and I grew up around this property. Um, and there's many in this whole East Island neighborhood, there's many 
elderly people that walk the neighborhood. And, you know, I got to say, I'm looking and I'm afraid they're going to break their back. I mean, right in front of that uh, stairway to the porch there, the, the great mass of these roots have completely uprooted the sidewalk. And, you know, I don't know exactly what the solution is for that, but it is dangerous. Um, and it does get worse every year with the moisture and the freezing of the ground. Um, so I, I don't know what the answer with that is, but, you know, some have suggested we cut it down and plant new trees. Obviously, that's a town's issue, not something I'm just, I can just go do, which I, you know, I shouldn't be able to. But, but there is a safety concern with that. Now, also with the driveway uh, to the house to the left of ours, with, you can see they mentioned that they, they have no problem pulling out, which I, I completely agree. That's what I mentioned. If you have a compact car, yeah, you can make the swing. But if you have a van or a pickup truck or a minivan even, it's very difficult because out in front of this White House property, two cars park there and the brown house, one, one car normally parks right there. So the swing is very difficult. Let, and in, they're correct, in the winter time, when the uh, snow banks are up high and you're cut down even less of a turning radius, the driveway to the right of the house is basically obsolete unless you have a very small compact car. Um, so that, that's my point with that. Um, and we do want to increase the green space. So uh, like we mentioned in the application, there is a, uh, a driveway in the, at the end of the, uh, excuse me, a garage at the end of the uh, driveway on the right hand side, which we were going to take that back and uh, kind of rip out the concrete and reclaim it with uh, some sod or hydro seed or some type of uh, vegetation. Uh, so, so that's my point with that. Um, just wanted to, just wanted to Give my two cents. Appreciate that. Thank you. No problem. Um, I had a quick question for Mr. Valorelli. Um, let's change the share here. I can't tell what I'm sharing anymore. Um, so this is this being the, the site plan. So the 22 feet you've referenced from the porch to the rear lot line is that the 20 indicate that that is three feet short of the required 25 feet to count as usable open space? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. So the, the applicant is asking for two special permits, one being a second driveway and one being for the additional uh, increase in GFA without the usable open space. Okay, so the, the removal of the garage would not impact the amount of usable open space on the property? Uh, we'd have to do a calculation. I still see only 22 to that porch. Right. Um, I, I would, I would have, to, I'd have to recalculate it based on the garage not being there. Okay. But if it's only 22 feet in one direction, it doesn't count towards usable open space. That is absolutely correct. And that's how I base my calculations. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So for the board, we sort of, we have two you know, since we really reference, we have two decisions essentially to make on this property. One um, is specific to uh, the proposed dormer on the third floor, and the second is the uh, proposal for the um, for the second driveway. So, just quickly ask the the board, or just let's let's address the the issue of the dormer first. Um, are there questions and concerns in regards to that dormer? Mr. Chairman, Hanlon. Um, it seems to me the dormer is basically, uh, I mean, if it's 560 square feet, it's within the half story requirement. It's just barely within the half story requirement, but, but you know, if you make it, you make it. Um, clearly, as Mr. Revelak points out, you couldn't adopt a three person use, a, a three family use here. Uh, except uh, insofar as the ADU uh, ordinance applies. Um, and as somebody who was in town meeting and voted for that ordinance, I don't think that would be a bad thing if it applied. That was the sense of town meeting is that uh, people ought to have the ability to uh, put in these ADUs. And uh, this would be somewhat of a small one. Uh, and it seems to me unlikely that it would it would happen. Um, but if it did happen, it would not necessarily be a bad thing. So I have a lot of concerns with the driveway, uh, but many fewer with the uh, dormer. Thank you. 
Other questions from the board in regard to the dormer, Mr. Revelac? Uh, Mr. Chair, I am also fine with the dormer, and like um, as Mr. Hanlon indicated, um, you know, the the ADU law what bylaw was well received by town meeting, and just for my own personal opinion, um, you know, if there if there so if people start building ADUs, well, that's great. I'll be happy, <laughs> you know, regardless of what happens with this project. So, yeah, I think the dormer is fine as proposed. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm searching for a piece of paper here in the background. I can't seem to put my finger on anymore. Um, So then we'll move on to move the discussion then forward to the question of the the second driveway. Um, I know the board has approved additional driveways um, in the past. Um, I think this is a little bit of a different situation than some of the others uh, because it is such a small space and because the the space available under the bylaw um, essentially the you know, the bylaw requires a certain minimum area for a parking space, and this property does not afford that minimum space on this side of the building. Um, and as was noted, the building already has the required legal minimum parking space uh, plus additional space beyond that. Um, so I, I, I do have concerns about the, the possibility of of adding a, an additional driveway on this side of the property, but I would like to hear from other members of the board what their thoughts are on this. Mr. Revelak. I mean, as proposed now, I would not be supportive of the additional driveway. Uh, and they're basically, um, you know, two, at least two, two, two very obvious reasons. Uh, it doesn't meet the minimum requirement for length. It's a foot too short, even for a compact car. And we also have a requirement on the spacing between driveways on a single lot, and we're a couple of feet short there. Um, yeah, and just, well, uh, to say a third reason, it is kind of tight, uh, particularly if one, you know, were to try to contemplate put adding a vegetated buffer along the side. So, um, you know, as proposed, I would, I would have a, you know, maybe one of my board colleagues can make a compelling argument to the contrary, but I'd be, um, I'd be very reluctant to approve. Thank you, Mr. Revelak. Mr. Mills. I would just like to say I concur and fully support what uh, Stevie so, so uh, eloquently stated. If this misses um, on several points, thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. Yeah, so uh, maybe just to take uh, what Mr. Revelak said a step farther. I mean, when you look at the bylaw and it, it, it does give you dimensions for parking spaces, and if you don't meet that, it's a dimensional requirement. And similarly, if, as he had pointed out, you have that section of the bylaw 6.1.11, where it requires the 30 feet between the two driveways, that's also a dimensional requirement. And I really don't think we have the authority to grant a driveway under those circumstances because you're looking at really what a variance would be doing, I think. So I, I think that's one of the reasons. And then I think for the reasons that were laid out also in the memorandum from the uh, planning uh, department, uh, that it would be problematic in terms of the area that would be paved permeability Etc. So I think for those reasons, I would not be supportive myself. Thank you. Thank you. Are there additional questions or comments from the board? Chairman. Mr. Hanlon? Just to sort of draw a conclusion, the, the dimensional things which come down to meeting certain numbers or not meeting those numbers, also are contributing to a lot of the discomfiture that people feel at looking at all the pavement uh, that there would be in the front yard, the, the tightness of the connection between that and the and next door. Uh, the question as to whether you can get an adequate buffer there, I mean, just you, you can't plant just a little bit of grass. It would have to be under the bylaw, a genuine buffer, and it would be difficult to do that here. If you walk up and down the street, you see only one other house that I could see that had 
two driveways on opposite sides of the house. There are a number of double driveways uh, where they're on the same uh, side of the house, but they uh, will allow two cars back and forth. And when you look at it, you can it just feels like it has more room uh, than, than this one does. So uh, that may be sort of like a queen bed and this is like two singles, but it, it has a feeling of tightness and scrunched upness that uh, is, I think, disturbing to the neighborhood and it all traces back to the absence of enough feet to accommodate the, uh, accommodate this, the construction. Thank you. Therefore, in regards to um, this property, so my 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 sense is um, from the board, if we were to vote, um, I think we would be looking to to. Uh, craft a vote whereby we would allow the addition on the third floor um, and we would disallow the addition of the second driveway, um, which I think we can do through condition. Um, does that sound correct, uh, Mr. Hanlon, that we could, that that would be the, the proper way to do that? Yes, I think that I think that's right. I mean, strictly speaking, this isn't two different applications, so that we can we can approve one and deny the other. But uh, it should be possible to clearly state in the conditions what it is we're approving and what it is we're not. Okay. Um, so for for special permits, the board has three standard conditions, which it applies um, to all decisions. Um, which just read. Uh, for the record at the moment. Uh, so the number one is the final plans and specifications approved by the board for the permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. There should be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, condition number two is the building inspector is hereby notified monitor the site and to proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time he determines that violations are done by law under the provisions of chapter 40 section 21d and institute non-criminal complaints if necessary the inspector of buildings may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action also in accordance with section 3.1 and third um, is the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to this special permit um i did wish to go back quickly to the package here because there was a uh, question that was raised in regards to the um, the windows um, on the house. I think Mr. Mills is correct. The deviation from alignment is fairly minor. Um, the, so the location of those windows, so it does appear that the the, the three windows that are all slightly off is are the three one the three here, um, so the one here at the stairwell it appears could be shifted slightly to align with the other stairwell windows below. Um, the window here, um, I believe, actually was in alignment, and the last one is this window here in the bathroom. Um, so this, this window here, we could slide over to align with these. That wouldn't be an issue. This one's already in alignment. Um, this one here, um, I think the side of it does align, but the window is wider. And uh, my question would just be for, is there anyone um, on the board who has an issue with the alignment of the windows as they're shown here that we should address at, in a condition? worth having that I mean we could specifically request that the, the stairwell window be shifted over but I mean the bathroom window the only way to address that is to make a smaller window in the bathroom and I don't think that that's not that it's not within our purview but that it's not Mr. Mr. Chairman Hanlon? I it seems to me that I would not I would not favor doing that uh, this is as 
we're talking about aesthetics here and dealing with the design. This is a relatively small part on the design. It is aligned. It's just as a fatter window. Uh, and I think that the whoever lives here is entitled to have the window that fat. There's not enough of a contrary interest to lead us to try to regulate that. Okay. And then I, I don't think there are any other conditions that we would impose in regards to the dormer and therefore the only remaining um, would be a fourth condition, which would be the request for a second driveway under section six point one point ten, I believe. Six point one point ten A. Mr. Chairman, I had a thought as uh, to how to deal with that. If it, if it would be welcome, um, it's. I think we could do that by saying the proposed second driveway under six point one point ten is not approved as part of the final plans. Okay. And establishment of said driveway is prohibited. Sounds very good. Are there any other questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, uh, may we have a motion? Mr. Chairman. Um, I move that we grant the special permit application in this case in part and deny it in part subject to the conditions that have just been read into the record. Hanlon, do I have a second on that? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Any further questions from the board on the proposal? No. Seeing none, um, on the motion to approve in part, uh, in part for the four conditions, uh, vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Revlak? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Um, so the, uh, the, the dormer is approved and the second driveway is not approved. And that concludes this hearing. Thank you all very much. Next item on our agenda, item number 10, which is docket 3670, uh, 5 Cheviot Road. Um, so the applicant, uh, Ms. Nunez, if you would like to um, go ahead and identify yourself and tell you what you would like to do. And in the meantime, I will track down your drawings. Sure. Um, hi, my name is Charlotte Nunez. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm proposing to, well, I live in a single family residence in 5 Cheviot Road, and I'm proposing to change a portico that I have to a porch. Um, I think it will make the aesthetics of my home in the front look uh, much more pleasing. Um, I don't believe there's, um, it would be a huge difference from what I have now, other than expanding out the porch. Um, I think I'll leave technical questions to uh, my design team, Pioneer Architecture, which I think, believe is on the line, Lydia Sodasco. Yes, but if the architect would like to introduce themselves and make some comments. Uh, yes, Lydia Sodasco from Pioneer, and there's also John Hill on the line as well, um, who filled out the application. Um, and um, what I wanted to point out to that we are, um, I'm, I'm going to put it in a short and very sweet note uh, in here, just because there's really not much to it. So basically when you see the scope is the, um, when you see the existing roof and the stairs, um, that's where we are going to take that apart because it is not in a good condition. And what we are planning on doing to replace that with a porch that's a little bit wider so it's pretty much from right side to the left side with the same depth and um, replacing the stairs um, to a little bit of a, a wider staircase 
and uh, having uh, instead of the roof that's um, currently on the building, which is uh, a gable roof uh, over the portico, uh, we're trying to uh, put a flat roof on that and have some railings above. And that's really the scope of work of this project. There is some work on the back, but it's not a concern because um, it, it it meets the um, the criteria for and, and the requirements. Um, uh, for the setbacks. Uh, so currently the front setback is um, where um, it is, is the same as, as it was um, before, basically. The proposed, I meant to say. Um, and uh, we are proposing to have beautiful landscape around. Um, as you see, um, the existing roof is staying where it is and on this uh, elevation, since you're looking at that, um, you can see the railings and by the way, this is not a true balcony. The windows are the same as they were previously. Um, we're not changing any um, of the windows on the front at all. Do you have other questions? The side. Um, so I was originally confused looking at the drawings at the roof, the roof line wrapping at the front. But so these portions of roof here, these are the, these are. These are the not, existing. They don't come all the way out. They, they stay back where they are. Right. Okay. Right. Good. Um, that was the only question I had had. Um, are there questions from the board in regards to this application? Several shaking heads. Um, quickly, want to going to bring up the memorandum from uh, the planning board. <laughs> Hello. Um, if you could hold off, are you, unless you're the applicant, if you could hold off and, until we have public comment. Yep. Um, so this, this is just from, uh, so essentially the, this is just from the Department of Planning and Community Development. Um, they do not have any specific concerns about the property. Um, this is the view in the front of the house. So this is the, that roof to the sides of the portion will remain in place. It's just this portion here um, that is being reconstructed. And then the porch, there'll be porch extended to the sides as well, but it will not be covered porch at the sides. Um, and that, that's the recommendation of the planning department. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Um, just ask a second time, members of the board, are there any questions or comments in regards to this application at this point? I just had a question. Um, if you could hold off, please, we'll call on you. So, oh, Mr. Chairman, yes, please. Can I see that front elevation again? Yes, please. Um, Okay, it, it is a little bit confusing. You know, the existing roofing is staying back and this is jutting out. Yep. Yeah, so Can this you have is a side roof. elevation, please. Is. This is the side elevation. So it's right here. So it's this existing roof is remaining. I see. This is the extension of the this portion of the gambrel at the end. Okay, thank you. I'm all set. All right, thank you, Mr. Mills. Um, so I will now open um, this hearing for public comment. Uh, so members of the public who wish to speak to please digitally raise your hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the host and you'll be asked to give your name and address. You'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. 
Um, so first on our speakers list today is Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I just uh, have a quick question I'd like to ask for you of the architect and the applicant. Did uh, they utilize the uh, design suggestions uh, that the town has put together to come up with this plan? I never can remember the name of those. Uh, the, the residential design guidelines. Thank you. Yes, I can never. Thank you. <laughs> Certainly. Um, I just asked that of the of the um, of the architect. Um, we will. Uh, did you take advantage of the residential design guides guidelines uh, prepared by the town of Arlington? I believe we had looked at them. I <laughs> when we originally fired this, it was um, in May. Uh, so it's been a while for me to remember this, but um, I believe we did look at uh, the regulations and the guidelines. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd just sure. like to commend them for having done that. I, I think, again, these uh, design guidelines are starting to show up in the plans, and I'm pleased to see that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on the list is Ms. Carswell. Hi, sorry. Oh, that's can you okay. see me and hear me? We can. If you can just give us your name and address for the record and then tell us what you'd like. I'm just next door, 24 Intervale Road. Okay. What... So I'm just trying to clarify it's in the front of the house, not the back of the house. Um. So the portion that falls under our jurisdiction is at the front of the house. Uh, the portion of the rear of, the, let me go back to the plan here. So the portion of the rear of the house, um, and I'll ask Mr. Valarelli to confirm that this portion can be constructed by right. Is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. So there is an addition at the front and the back, but it's only the portion at the front that is under the jurisdiction of the VBA. Yeah, because the back is just, she's already got the back, right? The back is, the back can be approved by right and may already have been. I'm sorry, I can't hear very well. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so the portion at the rear does not need the approval of the zoning board. So it's, okay. I don't know the status of the permit. All right. Anything further? No. Okay, thank you. Are there any members, other members of the public who wish to address this application? Well, seeing none, I'm gonna go ahead and close the public comment period for this hearing. Um, so members of the board, um, so we have the application to, um, bring that back up, sorry. So it'll be the removal of the existing front porch, uh, construction of a new front porch um, covering these. There we go. So it's a, it's a longer front porch along the, the front of the property with steps coming up. Um, so nothing is enclosed. And then up at the second floor level, um, it is just a, it's a, it's a, you know, essentially it's like a, it looks like a porch, but it's not going to be used as a porch because there's no access to it. Um, is there any questions or comments from the board in regards to this plan? Um, seeing none, we have our for a project like this. We have our typical three um, conditions, which we read into the record for the prior hearing, which we would apply here. Um, also, we have been applying an additional um, criteria on similar projects where there's a, a new front porch being introduced, um, which is that the, the, the area of the new porch is not to be considered within the foundation wall of the building. Um, and the, the reason for that, um, for that condition is just that the, the addition of the porch should not allow 
uh, the creation of additional enclosed space over the porch without returning to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Are there any other um, conditions concerned, Mr. Revelak? Um, I would suggest adding the condition that the front porch remain unenclosed in perpetuity. Are we allowed to state something in perpetuity? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon? I feel a little uncomfortable with it, but you know, it is it the condition lasts as long as the special permit does. And as a practical matter, it seems to me it's the same whether we say it in perpetuity or not. I, I prefer I prefer not to, to say that so be, because it suggests overreaching. We've not generally been saying that. It, we did not use the words in perpetuity in um, the ones we approved today, uh, although there had been some discussion of it uh, uh, at the previous hearing. Uh, but again, I, I think in substance, it doesn't matter a great deal. It's, it's just that some of us are closer to perpetuity than others, and it causes a certain degree of anxiety. Um. Happy to strike those words <laughs> for my suggestion. I was gonna say we could leave it just as front porch, the front porch is to remain unenclosed, or we could say the front porch is to remain unenclosed without further action from the Zoning Board of Appeals. But. Mr. Chairman, I wonder if we could just, the we have now gotten to the point where on the, our docket is overwhelmed by protrusions into front yards. That, that must be something like 60% of all the cases we have uh, on those. And, it, and in every one, uh, we attach a, a condition that is equivalent to the one about the foundation of the building that we just talked about. And we've also been doing the open portion of the porch, uh, or however you would say that given the given application, uh, shall remain unenclosed is, is also one that we're adopting everywhere. Um, and I would just propose that we treat those uh, as, as uh, standard conditions in cases of this kind and just automatically do it without having to words, wordsmith them each time. Okay, I think that's fair. So anything further on this application? None, I think we are ready for a vote. May I have a motion on this item? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, I move that the application uh, before us be approved subject to the five conditions that have been read into the record. Mr. Hanlon, may I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Hi, I'm sorry, may I ask a question? Um, so the public comment period was closed, um, but oh, okay. what, is your, what, is, what is your question? Just about, I know there's no timetable on the construction or the timing of the construction. Um, is, yeah. Is there in the town a restriction? You, you mean in terms of how long and until the construction can occur? No, or what time of day the onset can versus offset. Um, so, Mr. Valarelli, uh, does the town have strict construction hours? Um, Mr. Chairman, I believe Rick just had to step away for two no, minutes. Okay. So, I believe the town does have hours under the noise guidelines, but they relate to specific pieces of equipment. They don't relate to construction in general. But I, if I'm remembering correctly, I think it's eight to six Monday through Friday and nine to five on weekends, um, but that's in title, I think it's title five of the town bylaws. Thank you. You're welcome. Another, see nothing further, vote of the board. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hamlin? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Revelak? Aye. Chair votes aye. So the 
motion to approve uh, the proposed project for Five Cheviot Road with the five conditions stated has been approved. We are good to proceed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And this brings us to item 11 on our agenda, which is docket number 36749111 Adams Street. So if I could ask the applicants to introduce themselves and explain to us what they would like to do. And in the meantime, I will bring up your drawings. Yes. Hi, good evening. My name is Heidi Weddick and I'm here with Greg Walters. We own 911 Adams Street. Um, and we are requesting to the board to demolish our existing garage and reconstruct a new garage that has an additional 125 square feet. Um, our existing structure has failed and we need to uh, update it and fix it. Um, and we'd like to make it a little bit larger to ensure that we can house two cars as well as lawn equipment, bikes and other things to keep it off the yard and out of the driveway. Where is the application? So this is the site plan of my understanding is so that the, up to this line here, assuming you can see my cursor is the existing garage and the request is to for the new garage to extend this additional. That's correct. Okay. Then there were additional drawings were made available. Um, This is the this is the end elevation. So this being the front, that being the rear. Yeah, the design is intentional, so the addition won't be visible from the street and mimics the existing structure. The side elevations, so the side facing into the yard, and this is a side facing the abutting neighbor. That's so correct. I saw that so the, you're indicating um, on the rear elevation, three windows facing out the back. Is that correct? That's correct. There's currently one large window in the garage facing out the back. It's a too wide double hung. Um, uh, Mr. Valerelli, have you returned? Yeah, yes, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I have. Okay. Um, so this, let me go back to package. So this garage is being shown um, approximately a foot off the line, which is allowed under the bylaw, but I believe it's only allowed under the bylaw if it's type one construction. Is that correct? That's correct. In RO, one and two districts only. And so, um, the applicant had submitted a list of uh, materials, I believe. Um, and it indicated so is the intent that the walls are going to be will be the back and side walls will be concrete or that they'll be framed wood maybe framed wood with hardy board for a type one because that won't meet type one construction. Um, so type one is not is fully non-combustible construction. Um, 
And so it's a Mr. Um, Mr. Alarelli, can you elaborate a little on what would be accepted as type one construction? Uh, we will leave that up to the design professional, Mr. Chairman. Okay. A complicated issue, and I would want that documented by a registered design professional. Okay. Yeah, our intent is to make it type one. Okay. We were just in, we were informed that the Hardy Board would, would suffice for that. So the yeah, so the the Hardy Board, you know, is a is a non combustible uh, surface material, but the the framing itself needs to remain non combustible. Okay. Um, and so that would that would need further further revision, but that's a that, that would be an item more for the building department than it would be for the for the zoning board. Okay. The yeah, our intent is type one to use the existing footprint, just move into the yard of okay. uh, the additional 125 square feet. Questions from the board? Uh, Mr. Chair? Mills. I stepped out for me. I'm not sure if this question got addressed. The slope of the roof? No. Appears to be inadequate. Back to that document. I think it's one inch 12 and not two inch 12. So there's currently not a slope indicated. Um, yeah. Looks like two feet over 24, roughly. Which would be one in 12. It's also it slopes towards the property behind. Would there be a gutter to to collect the water on this property, or would the water shut off to the property behind? Currently, the roof is sloped in the same direction and just sheds into the water behind. Our intent is to put a gutter with the rain collection to okay. be able to use to you know water our lawn and plants and those items. Um, Mr. Valarelli, is there any concern about the slope of the roof? Well, it would have to, it would have to meet uh, a minimum of uh, two and 12. Mm -hmm. um, so my apologies, Mr. Chairman, I noticed as I was system through the documentation for tonight's hearing last week that this particular package was missing some elevation. So the applicant was kind enough to, uh, uh, to include these. I'm not seeing, I, I, I have not seen these until tonight. So okay. Again, uh, 23 um, requirements that a builder has to comply with before he's issued a building permit, excuse me. Mm -hmm. And the sl slope is certainly one of them. And I have uh, additional questions regarding this, but it has nothing to do with the um, gr uh, granting of a uh, special permit. Okay. But if the, if the applicant had a suitable roofing material, could they provide a roof with a lower slope than two and 12? Yes, they could because the code relaxes on the roof. We go to from type one to type three B. So okay. our options open up. Okay. Are there further questions from the board? Seeing none, um, I'd like to open the meeting for public comment, um, as stated earlier, if uh, members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you'd like to speak. You'll be called upon by the host and asked to give your name and address and you'll be given time for your questions and comments. Any comments or questions from the public? Mr. Loretti. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street. Can you hear me okay? We can, sir. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have several concerns about this um, proposal, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to begin um, with some that relate to the whole thing procedurally. And that is the uh, legal notice and the memo from the 
planning department reference section 8.1.3 B of the zoning bylaw, which pertains to non-conforming one and two family dwellings. But we have a garage here and, and it's not a dwelling. And I believe the more appropriate section of the bylaw that the ZBA should be looking at is 8.1.4, which is other non-conforming structures. And the structure is non-conforming because it leads to an excess of the lot coverage. Um, as you know, the maximum is 35%. This house and garage as it stands is already at 40%. And the planning department has um, said that it will increase to 44%. But the criteria under section 8.1.4 do not allow an increase in the non-conformity of the dimensional and density regulations. Um, so I'm not sure how this can go forward on that basis. Um, it also, if they're tearing down the structure, then they're removing the non-conformity and then they can't put, I think by building a new larger structure there, you could also argue that they're creating a new non-conformity once, once they tear down the garage, if that is indeed the plan. Um, so that's, that's my main concern about the section of the bylaw that's being looked at and how this is being considered. But, uh, but beyond that, I would say that the existing garage is already somewhat larger than the garages in the neighborhood. And, um, you know, the, the, this is a significant increase in the size. Um, and it's also an increase in the height. And I think you, you need to consider that as well. When they use the 12 foot figure for the height, I believe what they're measuring to is to the height of the top of what looks like a gable from the street. I think that's really kind of a fake facade. It's this little wall above the, um, above the front, um, above the garage door itself. And it appears the new garage will have an eight foot door instead of a seven foot door. Um, and so the height of the garage at both the front and the back will be significantly higher than it is now. And I think particularly for the neighbors on Foster Street who live behind the house, it, it does present a 10 foot wall for quite a significant fraction of that lot line that's not there right now. So I, I would also have um, concerns about that. And you know, I have to wonder when you see this kind of uh, large addition to a garage, whether there's some other use that's actually intended beyond what the applicant's just describing. And I could foresee, um, this, you know, perhaps being turned into an ADU and getting this special permit for a garage and then getting a buy right ADU developed sometime in the future. Um, whereas if they were to wait for the ADU bylaw to come into effect, they would need to get a special permit just for the ADU. So I have to, I have to question whether that, um, you know, is, is happening here as well. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about the, the planning memo. Um, which I find inappropriate in a number of respects, um, because the the memo, um, you know, says that the garage is consistent with the bylaw, but clearly is not consistent with the bylaw if it's increasing the nonconformity, which it certainly is with with respect to the lot coverage. Um, and unfortunately, our planning department and ARB really take a very lax approach to open space. Uh, on the lots and, and the open space on this lot is significantly less than what is expressed in the application that was sent to you. It has very little because of the garage and, and the fact that it's a very small lot to begin with. Um, so I, I, you know, I disagree with the um, planning department's recommendation. And frankly, I don't believe it's appropriate for the planning department to be recommending to you what to do. They can certainly, you know, lay out what the issues are what past practice has been and how this fits with other houses in the neighborhood, but it's really not their job to tell the ZBA whether to vote up or down on particular proposals. Um, and finally, I just want, I was surprised when I joined this meeting to find that there's actually a member of the redevelopment board sitting on the zoning board of appeals. Mm -hmm. I too was the state appointee to the redevelopment board and when I went to ZBA hearings, the first thing the chairman asked me is what I was doing there. Was I representing myself or was I representing the ARB? And, and frankly, I don't know who, what the representative of the ARB or, is doing on the, your board and who he's representing. So I hope, um, Mr. Chairman, I believe he is a, an associate 
member. I hope you won't be using him in the future. And I will be expressing my concerns to your appointing authority for the ZBA about this. Um, but that's all I have right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Loretti. Um, so Mr. Revlack it was recently appointed to serve um, on the Arlington Redevelopment Board. He's been a, a member of the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, for over a year. Um, he has submitted to the board um, or his, his letter of resignation, which is set to occur at the end of the Thorndike Place hearing, um, which the, and the board has conferred with town council on this and council has confirmed that there, um, there's no legal reason he cannot serve on both boards. And um, it is really an extenuating circumstance because of the, the uh, 40B application at Thorndike Place. It's very important that we maintain um, our members of our board as many as we can going into the, the final deliberations. And for that reason, um, the board has uh, has asked Mr. Revelak to remain a member of, an associate member of the Zoning Board of Appeals until the conclusion of Thorndike Place, at which point um, his resignation will be accepted and he will serve on the redevelopment board um, and no longer on the Zoning Board of Appeals. And so, um, that is a that is a reason for his appearance um, on both boards, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, I should just say for the record that if I had my druthers and Mr. Revlak had the time, I'd be perfectly happy for him to continue this relationship indefinitely. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Excuse me. Um, next on the speaker list, um, another Mr. Klein at uh, 16 Adam Street. I um, just wanted to weigh in. I'm a neighbor almost directly across the street. Um, and, you know, I, I really have no interest in, you know, whether or not they, they rebuild the garage. Um, no dog in that fight. But, you know, I can't say that I've been watching them renovate their house since they moved in a couple of years ago. Nice weekends, do it themselves by hand. You know, I, I think that it is tough to get cars in the driveway, uh, in the garage. I think that having a little extra space in the garage would probably go a long way. You know, um, there's not a lot of space if you're putting cars in these garages to put snowblowers, bicycles, whatever else. And I think a little bit goes a long way. Um, I, I'd also like to say that presently their garage is absolutely consistent with uh, size-wise with ones you know immediately surrounding it on Adam Street anyway. I can speak for you know their neighbors to the left. I can speak to my own house, uh, my other neighbors uh, adjacent to us. So you know, I, I did want to say that and I think it's important that you know while they're looking probably to go a little bit larger footprint wise, I think you know being in a butter since you know that increase is really behind their house and not visible from the street. I have you no know, Problem whatsoever with it. Thank you. Um, next on the speaker's list is Mr. Moore. Yes, Mr. Chairman, Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Uh, I just also want to note for the record that um, uh, Mr. Revelak certainly did not flash tilt when Mr. Hanlon made his uh, previous suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further public comments? I believe the hands that are up are just left up from earlier. Please speak up, that's incorrect. Hearing none, last call for public comment on Adam Street. Hearing none, the public comment period for this hearing will now be closed. So there is a, a couple questions on this application. We've already discussed the question about the, um, the construction type for the garage. Um, and uh, one of the one of the speakers raised the question about whether 
if the garage is demolished, does that then remove the nonconformity uh, from the property? And ask Mr. Ballarelli to address that because I believe there's a specific reason that there's a request being made to demolish the garage. Mr. Chairman, to the best of my knowledge, the garage is structurally compromised. I have not seen it personally, but I've had a discussion with the applicant, and I think that is the um, the reason uh, for this for this whole endeavor. Um, I'd ask that applicant if, if that what the current status of the garage is. That is correct. the The roof has failed. It's a cement roof, um, and it's cracked and leaking. Um, and the rear wall is leaking water. Um, it's in really rough shape. So <laughs> <laughs> our, our problem was if, if we have to do major repairs and, and take it down or rebuild it, that you know the additional 125 25 square feet would serve us well for uh, parking cars storage bikes you know with kids and all those different things that come with it so mr chairman mr. hanlon um i was wondering whether within the knowledge of the board um we've had occasions before mr uh, uh Loretti has suggested that the right way to look at this is not through the provision relating to non-conforming uh, single family and two family dwellings, uh, but other non-conforming, uh, I guess in this case, he would say structures. Um, and it can't be the first time anyone has tried to expand to build a bigger garage. Uh, and I'm wondering whether we have a, uh, a history of interpretation so that we have a practice that we could follow one way or the other as to which of the provisions of the zoning bylaw applies uh, in this kind of case where you're, where you're expanding the accessory structure uh, that is associated with a uh, one or two family dwelling. You know, ask Mr. DuPont if he recalls, I don't recall such a request in the past. I know we've had situations where there's been a request to build a new garage, but not one where there was an existing garage to begin with. Mr. DuPont, do you recall any prior? No, that's roughly my memory as well, build the garage. Or I know we've had issues where, or we've had applications where we've had, um, we've had structures that were unsound and then those have been replaced and I just don't think though that those entailed increasing the size I I too I was I was a bit um, confused uh, along the lines of Mr. Loretti had suggested about the application of the 8.1.3 to this as far as it being a uh, non-conforming single family or two family dwelling. And I, I do think it's not a dwelling on the one hand. On the other hand, I was looking at the open space and lot coverage regulations, and I'm not sure that it gets me any farther along in trying to analyze this, but I was looking at uh, page 5.16 and it's, it indicates permitted structures, maximum lot coverage, 35%. And then it said below that, uh, any, other permitted structure and there's there's a line there's a dashed line and I don't know how to interpret that it seems like there's a bit of an ambiguity I don't know whether that means that we don't have to concern ourselves with the lot coverage for this accessory structure or other permitted structure so I'm not sure that I'm adding anything to this but I'm just expressing where I too in looking have sort of come to a question mark about what the bylaw really intends. You know, all of the comments that have been made by all the speakers, I, I think help, but I still haven't come to a conclusion myself. I'm trying to find that relevant section in the
And Mr. Chairman, if I may, I, I couldn't tell, but is there any usable open space on this lot? Does not appear to be the case. Okay. Because the section that was referenced in the planning department memo, uh, the section seven of whatever that was, where it just says uh, private detached garages need not conform to side yard and or rear yard setbacks. And then it gives a table. And I think that we were talking about that, but it's the following page that indicates um, the section I was referring to about any other permitted structure and lot coverage. So I didn't even know if that 40 to 44% was relevant. This is the zoning bylaw. So this is the section that deals with the location of the setback for the garage. Yep. Um, so it can, so it's type type one type two construction with a three B roof um, allows it to be closer to the lot lines than it would normally be allowed. Um, and then the lot coverage question. I have it. I think it's the prior page. Um, lot yeah. coverage. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mills. Can I address this question to Mr. Val Lorelli? I think he may have it off the top of his head. Certainly. What specifically is your question, Mr. <laughs> Mills, regarding lot coverage or? So regarding maximum lot coverage. Okay, so they, they are in a pre-existing condition um, before we even start this. Their lot coverage as it is 44.86% because they're extending that garage. Uh, the garage that was there is slightly smaller, granted, but I think what makes this a little bit more complicated is the fact they want to put on an eight and a half by 17 foot little storage wing on that garage. So that now increases the lot coverage to 48.06%. By the way, already pre-existing non-conforming, they're extending a non-conformity. Um, if that wing was not proposed on the, on the side of that garage, this would be a by right permit um, because they're entitled to build a garage on the lot line type on construction uh, they are clearly under the maximum height of 20 feet, and uh, we don't even have to get into the situation of can you replace something with something new um, once we remove it because in the section of the bylaw it addresses um, uh, structurally compromised buildings and buildings that are destroyed by fire. Uh, and I, I can't put my finger on that section right now, uh, but it, it exists. So the fact that this garage is structurally compromised, they come in the building department for a permit that is a by right permit. All they're asking the board for is the extension of the non-conformity from a pre-existing 44.86 lot coverage to a 48.06 lot coverage. Um, I see nothing more than that. They never had any open space. I hope that answers your question. So I think the, the, the question that was raised was whether, so this is the building, the garage itself is not a single family or two family dwelling. It's a it's an accessory structure. So it would be a non-conforming structure other than a single family or two family dwelling. Um, and so I think the question that was raised was, so the repair, reconstruction, extension, addition, so that you know, a damaged or unsafe structure can be reconstructed. Um, and I don't think there's any question in regards to that. But the question was under section 814. It says that no building area or floor area where already non-conforming 
shall be increased so as to create greater nonconformity. So I don't, is the garage considered to have a that is nonconforming? Is that a question directed at me, Mr. Chairman? Um, yes. Okay, so again, I think that uh, the only thing that kind of throws a monkey wrench into this, if you will, for lack of a better term, is um, the garage rebuild is fine, but they want to extend the nonconformity by that eight and a half by 17 foot storage area attached to the garage. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Um, the provision with which there's a alleged, well, with respect to which there's a nonconformity um, is not one that's limited to the garage. Uh, in effect, all of the structures taken together, including the house, are contributing to uh, the uh, exceeding of the lot coverage uh, requirement. And it seems if if you had imagined, for example, that they were adding a little bit to the house, uh, you wouldn't have any real problem with that, I don't think, at least under this argument, uh, if the increase had been what it is. Um, and there isn't any particular lot coverage requirement that applies to the garage specifically. And I'm not entirely convinced that in this situation, uh, the provision relating to to uh, the primary use is not the one that dominates. Uh, and if that's true, then I think the planning uh, department's memorandum seems seems to be right as to what what one could do. Um, it isn't as if you were talking about something that applied only to the accessory use, uh, but it applies to the sort of entire complex of buildings uh, on on the site, it, it is entirely possible for a garage of this kind to be attached to the house and trying to figure out and treat what the impact when you have this kind of nonconformity, trying to separate out the garage from the dwelling uh, seems to me to be arbitrary. And the dwell and the overall use, the primary use is the use of this of this land, this property as a uh, as a dwelling space. So my inclination would be to go that way, but I could be persuaded otherwise if there was some clear authority to it or if in dealing with this question, we had a consistent pattern of interpretation one way or the other. Uh, I wouldn't want to be just jumping around, um, but on the, if I know no more than I do right now, I'd be sort of inclined to think that uh, um, that paragraph B applies rather than paragraph D. Currently under the zoning bylaw, a accessory structures greater than 80 square feet in private garages, um, there is not a specific size requirement or a maximum size for that um, in the zoning bylaw. And that specific section 814, where am I? I'm still in the sevens. Four. It says no building area or floor area where already nonconforming shall be increased so as to create a greater nonconformity. So currently there is not a nonconformity in the garage in regards to building area or floor area. As far as I can determine. Um, and that being the case, I, I don't think 814B would apply. But I don't know if others agree with that inter interpretation.
order 814E, safe and be restored. Restoration work shall not place the structure in greater nonconformity. So I is it so would the is it the consideration of the board that the lot coverage is a nonconformity related to the lot and not a nonconformity related to the structure? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon? It's it's really it's really both. It's it obviously the lot would not be out of compliance if there was no structure on it because the whole point is that how much is on the lot. Uh, the difficulty here is that the coverage is the aggregate of the coverage attributable to the dwelling and the cover coverage attribute attributable to the garage. Uh, it's it's both structures, um, and one is accessory to the other. Um, so I think that it isn't it isn't uh, this is not a nonconformity that relates to this particular structure. It's something that relates to the structure to this plus the dwelling, and uh, it seems to me that. So then you have to characterize it one way or the other. Uh, and it seems to me that it makes more sense to characterize it by the principal, by the uh, principal structure than treating the accessory as if it were by itself. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. I would, I would support that look. I do think that you can read these different provisions of the bylaw and you can, you can be led in different directions. And I think it's our job at times to be able to try to synthesize a reasonable or rational response based upon all of the information that we have, including what the text is. And you have up in front of you uh, section 8.1.4e, and it says um, that a structure determined to be unsafe may be restored to a safe condition and it goes on to say, um, it shall not place the structure in greater nonconformity. And you've already pointed out that you didn't think in terms of uh, area, uh, it, there was a nonconformity if you looked at it, even if you did look at it separately, as opposed to the approach that Mr. Hanlon's suggesting. But then it says it may be exempted, the structure may be exempted from this provision by special permit. And you could conceivably read to say, that that refers to both the completion within one year, but also perhaps um, with regard to having the structure create a greater nonconformity. So I just think that after all of this is laid out on the table and we weigh it, I think we try to deal with the intent uh, behind these provisions taken together. And I'm comfortable with Mr. Um, Hanlon's suggestion that we should be viewing this uh, in the aggregate. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Mr. Ravillac. I, um, I agree with Mr. DuPont. Very good. Are there any further questions from the board? I think at this point, it sounds like we are coming towards a, uh, a consensus that this, this is something we could allow um, under the bylaw. We have identified identified previously the standard three conditions that we would apply to such a thing. I think we would need to um, add an additional condition that um, the garage must comply with the provisions 
of, where's that section? The one that references the construction type, because that's really going to be the ends in B7. Five, four, two. Two, B7. I would recommend a condition that the garage must comply with the provisions of section 5.4.2.B7, including building construction type. And Mr. Valerelli, I believe the building construction type would also address um, the possible location of windows. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. That was uh, my point early on. Perfect. Are there, is there, are there any other conditions that the board would want to impose upon this project? Seeing none, um, may I have a motion? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I move that the application before us be approved subject to the three standard conditions plus the fourth condition relating to uh, construction type that the chairman just read into the record. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Any further discussion? Seeing none, um, a vote of the board to approve uh, 911 Adams Street with the four conditions. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Reblack. Aye. And the chair votes aye. The application for 911 Adams Street is approved as conditioned. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. This brings us to item 12. On our agenda for this evening, docket number 36724 Cutter Hill Road. Hi, uh, this is Sai Lee of uh, 43 Cutter Hill Road. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, all the members of the zoning board to uh, allow me to present the application. At this point, I would like my architect, uh, Mr. Sean Yang, to present the plan. Uh, thank you. Well, welcome, and I will bring up the application here in just a second. Good evening, everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? Can. All right, so good evening, Chairman and Mr. Um, Important Members. So thank you for having us tonight. Uh, my name is Sean Liang. I'm the architect for these projects um, at 43 Cutter Hill Road. Uh, before Mr. Chairman bring up the, uh, the screen, I was just going to give you a little introduction of this project. So um, the house is um, is a one-story single-family house on, a, on the R1 lot. Um, existing, um, there is the entrance just facing right directly the street to uh, Cutter Hill Road. What we're trying to propose here, we're trying to build a, um, a front porch. Uh, it, it will be an open porch. Um, but we be we uh, we have a roof, um, and the purpose for that was to mainly for uh, mailman um, delivery and also package delivery. Um, right now, without it, um, you know, the packages and and, and mail just scatter around. <clears throat> it's not a nice scene to watch to see. As we all enjoy online shopping nowadays, so um, we hope that by doing this, we'll provide a, um, a nice shelter and um, a coverage. And also we're looking forward that this will become more, um, making a house more inviting um, to the neighborhood. 
Um, unfortunately, this uh, this open porch with the roof will be um, considered as will not be considered as an, an, an enclosed porch. So it's going to subject to um, to zoning bylaw um, section five point three point nine, um, and it's also this uh, beyond twenty five square feet. So roughly, we propose would be five feet by um, twenty feet. So, so it's going to be hundred square feet. Uh, uh, plus minus. So we are hoping that we can get a um, special permit from um, from you. Um, Mr. Chairman, would I be able to allow to share my screen just to give you guys some visual uh, reference what we what that will look like? Certainly, Mr. Valarelli, can you take care of that for us? Let me know if I can do it. Or Vin Lee, can you take, can you give him permission to share his screen? Uh, I am trying to do that. Uh, I believe as a co-host, I think I need uh, Rick to be able to do that. He is the- Okay. Uh, we can we can both, Vin, uh, sorry, Vin. Who are, we, who are we looking for, Christian? I'm sorry. Uh, to Mr. Liang. Okay, you should be good to go. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Can everybody see this? Yes. Oh, sorry, I don't remember. So this is the existing um, house. As you can see, um, the house opened directly to the front. There's no Nothing's covering covering it. Um, it's not it's not ideal. Every time when people you know deliver their package in the mail. So what we're trying to do, I'm going to show you another screen. I'm sorry, I am not the expert on Zoom. No, can't seem to find the right button. So when I'm, how about now? Can anybody see this now? Yes. Oh, so this is what we're trying to propose. Um, you know, the house, when you compare the two, it is really similar in, in terms of styles um, and, and I guess, I guess square footage as well. So this is what we're trying to propose on the outside, but it'd be, um, it'd be slightly bigger, I believe. I don't, I, right now by just looking at it, I think it would be six feet deep at least. So what we're trying to propose is maybe, maybe five feet, five feet deep by 20 feet. So overall, the, the style would be similar to this one. That's what we kind of propose. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you. And I just want to emphasize, this is not going to be, this is going to be fully open. It's never intended to put a wall around it. So this is the memo from the planning department. This. Three, six. Right. Here of the building. image to what the applicant had shown. Are there questions from the board in regards to this application? Seeing none. We'll go ahead and open this hearing for public comment. Uh, remember, members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. 
Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Uh, a question through you for the applicant. Uh, is Cutter Hill Road a private way? Mr. Lee, is it a private way? Yes, it is, yeah. So that explains the chain link fenced up against the road because it's a private way. Mm -hmm. It's not a, a setback or a sidewalk holding by the town. That's correct. Okay. This is on Cutter Hill Road. This is right before Cutter Hill turns from being a two lane street to like a three quarter lane street to get around a rock outcropping before it winds back <laughs> out again. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. I'm sure that's in compliance with all the road. Uh, <laughs> um, well, the reason I asked is that uh, the chain link fence was jarring and I thought up against the road. I, I didn't understand that at all. But thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Are there any other public questions or comments? Going once, going twice. Being no. Um, yes, here. talk, talk. Okay. Yes, it's, it's Wayne okay. and Susan. Ah, yes, please. Wayne and Susan Parsegian. And your address? 47 Cutter Hill Road. Yes, please. We're right next door to Cy. And we just wanted to say that um, we're perfectly fine with what they would like to do. Uh, it certainly looks like a nice design. Um, so they've been very nice neighbors since they moved in and we're happy to help them however we can and support them. Uh, just to touch upon the question that came up, yes, it is a private way. And my only concern, I, I guess it's, it's not major construction that's going on, but, um, being a private way and if any of you have been up and down it's um in pretty rough shape so i'd just be concerned about if there were large pieces of equipment that were going to uh impact the road any more than it already is so um i can speak to that um so in terms of construction i don't think they they will be using um cut the road for delivery so i think they will mostly happens on on the Johnson Road. Johnson. Yep. Okay. That's all I had. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any any further public comment? Seeing I'll go ahead and close public comment period for this hearing. Um I, I do agree with um, some of the public comments. I think it's a very you know, well thought out, well planned um, addition to the front of the house that does a really good job in keeping with the, um, you know, with the original style of the home. I think it will uh, provide a very good accommodation for the for the residents. Um, are there other questions from the board? I think we would. Uh, per Mr. Hanlon's suggestion earlier, we would have the sort of the standard five conditions for these projects, which would include not moving the building line, uh, or so the excuse me, the building foundation that would remain where it is, and that the portion of the porch that is proposed to be unenclosed will remain unenclosed. Um, are there any other conditions? Seeing none, um, may I have a motion in regards to 43 Cutter Hill Road? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I move that the board approve the application uh, for that is before us, subject to the uh, five standard conditions including the three regular standard conditions and the two relating to pro projections and two minimum yards. Thank Second. you. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Any questions about what we're voting on? Seeing none, um, the motion is to approve 43 Cutter Hill Road with five conditions. Um, vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Revelack. Aye. And the chair votes aye. That motion is approved. 
Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Takes us to item number 13 on tonight's docket, uh, which is 3668 125 127 Webster Street. Um, I understand from um, Mr. Valarelli that there may have been some um, new materials that were submitted uh, this evening. Is that correct? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, Rick Valarelli, if I may. Yeah. Uh, so the applicant redesigned his project and was presenting to the board tonight two scenarios. Uh, one, in fact, a variance for a, uh, an attic with a space greater than 50% or four below, which would constitute it as, as a story. He also was submitting plans for a special permit, which would be the typical lack of usable open space with the desire to add some uh, living space upstairs. Unfortunately, we did get the package and uh, Mr. Lee was kind enough to post those as fast as he could. The problem is, I guess I'll leave it up to the board and the applicant. Um, it is not the kind of ap application package that I would like to present to the board. I like to go through everything and make sure everything's there and literally got the package tonight at 631. So I guess if, uh, if Mr. McKenna is comfortable with what he sent me to proceed, I would leave it up to the chair and the applicant. Um, that is all I have to say. The rest is up to you guys. Okay. Um, so I am just seeing this for the very, very first time here. Mr. Um, Chairman? Yes, please, Mr. Hanlon. I just, you know, the, it's now just shy of 10 o'clock. And I'm not very happy with the idea of going into a hearing on an application that isn't even a single application. It's asking us to choose between two possible applications on the basis of plans that we haven't seen yet. Uh, and that Mr. Valerelli hasn't had a, a chance to, uh, hasn't had a chance to review. Uh, that puts us in a kind of a difficult spot, it seems to me. And, uh, and I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Allen. I appreciate that. Other members of the board? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman? Mr. Mills? I agree with Mr. Hanlon's sentiments. Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. DuPont. I agree with those sentiments as well. And I also think that it could work to the disadvantage of the applicants, because I think that if we are tasked with having to review materials, which we don't fully understand, I think it's quite more likely that there would be un there could be unintended uh, mistakes and misunderstandings. So I wouldn't want to see that either. Okay. Um, at present. Um, the board has currently has a hearing scheduled for Tuesday, November 9th, um, which is currently has uh, one item on it. So we could easily hear this on the 9th if that, if the applicant is not opposed to that. Not opposed. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I would just note also that we had that down as a possible deliberation date. We do. Did we not? So would we do both things on so the there's same there, We So the, currently they're scheduled for the ninth, um, a hearing for 31 Melvin Road, which is another new application. Okay. Um, so we would do both of these and then a possible, we have to dis, got, discuss the, the continuation dates for, for Thorndike. Um, but I'll go through the calendar um, in a couple minutes. Okay, so I think at this point I would look for a motion to continue 125-127 Webster Street to November 9th at 7.30. Chairman? Yes. 
So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hamlin. Second. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Vote of the board. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. <coughs> Mills? Aye. Revlack? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So we are continued on 125, 120 Webster Street, excuse me, 125, 127 Webster Street to November 9th at 7.30 p.m. All right. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much. Perfect. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, so the next, well, not really item on our agenda, but next on the agenda, um, let's pull up our upcoming calendar. Okay, so we just had tonight was the one in red. Um, so the board is scheduled to meet this Thursday, October 28th at 7.30 p.m. for to open the deliberation period for Thorndike Place. Um, and I think the first the first item on the agenda for that evening will be setting that the schedule for uh, when we will be meeting to deliberate um, on that hearing. Uh, it would be good to try to schedule something the week of November 2nd and 4th, if we can. Um, then as had stated on the November 9th, we already have a hearing for 31 Melvin Road. We will be adding to that the continuation uh, of Webster. Um, and then there would also be a possible evening to continue deliberation on Thorndike Place. Um, I do need to talk to the town about um, the format for how that would happen because we typically use a different meeting format when we're doing deliberations. So I'm not entirely sure how it works switching formats. Um, and then I would like to try to schedule uh, another deliberation section sometime the week of November 16th through 18 um, because uh, Tuesday, November 27th, I'd gone back and forth with Rick on this. Um, so we had discussed with the applicant trying to close the hearing on the 23rd, which is the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Um, the issue is that we had a series of hearings that we needed to schedule and we could either do them then or we could do them the following week. Um, but that following week is actually the, the week of Hanukkah. And so I'm trying to avoid, I would prefer to avoid scheduling hearings that week. Um, and so we kept them on. So there are currently um, four hearings on the docket for the 23rd, uh, but that would also be at the end deliber deliberation date on Thorndike Place. Um, so we need to think a little bit, and we can do this on Thursday, so exactly how we're going to run our schedule to meet those dates. And that, a lot of that comes down to just how many nights we need to do the deliberation on Thorndike. Any questions about the calendar? Um, Mr. Hanlon. I would like to suggest that <clears throat> when that we consider when we take up the deliberation from Thorndike Place to go backwards um, because the condition, well, the waivers, are, as we did, in fact, in the most previous hearing, the waivers uh, and the conditions lend themselves to sort of a piecemeal approach. Each one is a separate thing and the, any amendments to it uh, affect a single paragraph typically and not much more. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's easier to go through them and not get bogged down than it is uh, to do the findings where uh, a lot of that is just trying to figure out how to say exactly what we want to say. And we're thinking paragraph at a time is not as good really as thinking of thinking more broadly of sections. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that we might help ourselves make some progress. Uh, I know that I plan to offer a fairly substantial amendment on the transportation section. Uh, and there, there may be other things or organizational things. It's, it would be, it, we, it would help avoid getting us bogged down uh, to start with the easier parts first. Mm -hmm. uh, and to get to the things that are tend to be time consuming later on. And at that point, we may have alternative text to look at so that it would be, it would be simpler and go faster. 
I, I think that it would be great if we could finish on the 18th, actually, and uh, and enjoy Thanksgiving. And one of the things we could be thankful for is not having to deal with this on the 23rd. Absolutely. Absolutely. Here, here. <laughs> yes, uh, Mr. Chair? Mr. Revelak. I, I, I think Mr. Hanlon offers a wise approach. Um, you know, aside from being more straight, possibly more straightforward in you know, the conditions and waiver sections are probably um, also a little more substantive in that they are, they are things that the applicant will actually be held to. Um, whereas the, the narrative, while important, um, I don't think is quite, you know, it, it doesn't have the same set of responsibilities. Certainly. No, thank you. And we can, we can discuss this further on, on Thursday, but I, I agree that that's a very logical way to approach this. Anything further for this evening? No, we are at the end of our agenda. So thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting, especially wish to thank Rick Valarelli and Vincent Lee for all their assistance in preparing for and hosting this evening's meeting and to Kelly Lenema for providing the Department of Planning and Community Development memoranda. Please note the purpose of the board's recording is to, the recording of this meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It is our understanding that recordings made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the ZBA website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Do I have a second on that? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. All those in favor, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Revelak? Aye. The chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. You're welcome. Good night, guys. Good night, everyone. Nice job. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take Thanks, care. Rick. Good night, guys. <laughs>